Hello and welcome back. If you follow the channel, you know that we have been engaged in a bit of a vintage HP board repair song. We have a whole bunch of pretty boards from the 1970s. They come from a clock module interface from the very awesome HP 9025 desktop calculator. It was mainly used in the 1970s and early 80s to control complex test setups. Actually, a viewer sent me this photo of one, still in use at his workplace today, doing process control in an industrial plant. As they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We acquired no less than 6 modules and these have 2 boards each, so we have an impressive 12 boards to repair, with zero working when we started. We got to work in a previous episode and with the help of the Osmeloscope, the beautiful HP VNA and a purpose-made vintage LED watch chip tester, we were able to ferret a whole bunch of failed components. Two clock chips, two quartz crystals and three ICs. That first marathon got six boards back to green, enough to make three good interfaces. But we still have six boards left at yellow, that simple component replacement did not completely revive. These six remaining ones must have complex failures and promise to give us quite a workout. Allow me one last quick technical refresher from the previous episodes. The board on the right has most of the clock and uses two very exotic components. In its beautiful gold and white ceramic package, you can see HP's nano processor an early and proprietary processor that our buddy Ken Sheriff recently reverse engineered, which will become quite important as you will see. On the top you see the Texas Instruments clock chip. It comes from one of the early LED watch chips that had been repackaged in a regular IC just for HP. After much difficulty I was able to source some from China and reverse engineer them enough that I could build a watch from it. As you will see, that will also come in pretty handy. Alright, so we're back at it and uh, here are the two clocks that we repaired. The third one is in the 1925 and you can see it's working great. It's telling me that the date is October 13th and it's 9.00 and 42 seconds. The six boards here are our remaining bad boys with a yellow tag on my notebook. Three interface and three clock boards. Uh, we got them all to yellow, which is better than when they started where they were all red, they had obvious faults. And we know, we know the clock chip work on all of those, so it's something more complicated, so we have to probe it. And the problem with probing those things is that not only when it's a functional module, it's a sandwich of two boards, so it's really difficult to uh, access the, the pins. Uh, and then even if you could, from this side, when the module is in the machine, it's all the way inside, or at least partially inside. We could put that one with the module, I guess, like this. But then, no, it, it still wouldn't be very accessible. So the, the solution to this is to usually use an extender board, which will you know, bring the connector outside of the machine. And this is what this one is. It's not the exact uh, right extender board. It's for another instrument. So that's one I, I found in my collection. But you can tell that this is the right edge over here. The, the part number is 03582 dash something, which means it comes from the 03582 instrument, uh, which actually happens to be uh, close to Mr. Fancy Pants here in the catalog. It's this it's a uh, signal analyzer, uh, which is an instrument I don't have. Looks like we're in luck. We have an extension board that we have no use for. That is almost what we need. We just need a little bit of modification. Uh, so the first thing is to take good measurement and to cut this. And after that, I'll have to find a way to open up the two boards. All right. 
looks like it fits. So just to make sure it attached our interface and it still works. So extension is working. So now the next issue is to open these boards because I would like to probe them like something like this where I can have access to the ROM if I have to put the logic analyzer on it, uh, some of the chips and maybe the clock chip. Okay, I have been able to unfold my sandwich using jumpers. I got myself uh, hooked up and um, I color coded the stuff that was important. In particular, the three connectors in between the boards have all the important signals, but they are on the schematics, they are a little bit everywhere. So after a little bit of fooling around, I found a good way to uh, make sure the processor is uh, working as expected. One good line to monitor is the uh, chip select of the ROM, which actually very weirdly comes out of the processor and then goes to the other board and it's just a short and it comes right back. And that is the line I have on the bottom here. But those are all the ROM accesses right here. So that is doing fine. It's running some code. And the second line, the green one, that's more complicated. When I went to measure the one megahertz to the one kilohertz, uh, I found something weird is that one kilohertz was actually 500 hertz. It turns out that when Ken was working on reverse engineering the nanoprocessor, I gave him the code of the clock as an example. So this is another uh, part of the story that I, I glossed over. Uh, most of the clock is uh, functions are is run by this microprocessor, microprocessor complex. And actually this is a chip from HP called the nanoprocessor, which is an 8-bit processor, totally proprietary and very little was known about it until very recently when uh, through Antoine uh, Ken Sheriff was able to obtain the uh, original mask set of the chip and reverse engineer it down to the transistor level. So in the last few weeks we went from knowing almost nothing about the nanoprocessor to knowing everything it does down to the transistor level. And you can see Ken's article on it here, he has several. Um, and it's a totally weird processor. It's you know, a high speed processor that can't even add. But what it is really is a, a specialized controller to flip bits and it's very much the atmel of its time. Uh, it has a lot of IO pins. Uh, and it's very, very good at flipping bits uh, and not very good at calculating. So here's the, the, the mask set we got from the uh, engineer and was uh, reconstituted by Antoine because it was damaged. Um, here's the chip in question. This is a picture of one, one of one, uh, my boards. A uh, die picture was taken and uh, Ken could tell what every part does. And I'll put a link to uh, Ken's article um, and as Ken usually does, he goes to the you know, lowest level, he goes all the way back down to how transistors are made. Uh, this was an early process and that's somewhat unusual. And oh, doesn't that look familiar, right? This is my uh, clock board. And at this point, when Ken starts to have a good handle on the processor, he, he asks me, you know, can you possibly dump the code so we can look at some example code? And uh, that's what we are going to do here. Actually, it's, it's somewhat of a reenactment. So in order to do that, it wasn't that easy. Um, I, didn't, I used this uh, little, what's it called, mini pro um, prom reader. And I took the, this is, this is the, the ROM that has the code. If you look at the chip, there is actually uh, no regular chip markings on it. It has the HP kind of four numbers, that four number code. Um, and it's uh, most likely a mask ROM. So a ROM that you cannot program that's internal to HP. And from the schematics, I could tell it had the same pinout as a 2716, which is a you know 16 k bit or kilobits or you know, two kilobytes uh, ROM that was popular at the time from Intel. 
So uh, what I try first is to get it in and I did set up my reader as a 27C16 and see if we can read it. And we do read and it appears to read successfully but what it read is all FFs, it read absolutely nothing. So I thought well maybe it's not a 2716 or uh, it is a 2716 but the selection logic for mass chromes is different from the selection logic for uh, the EEPROM version and I, know I, I kind of look carefully at the, at the schematics and what it did and it didn't seem to do the same thing. Uh, but I could coerce it to be selected by changing the polarity on one pin. And this is this one over here. And that pin on the regular EEPROM is to ground and it appears that on the uh, mask prom it has to be to VCC. So then you have to do a little bit of acrobatic modification. Uh, you get to the fifth spin, spin, one, two, three, four, five, bend it out, try not to break it, Ooh, it's about to break, and I see it's very weak. Ah, yeah, yeah. So I'm redoing for a second, redoing it for a second time, okay, that, that will have to do. Get over here, short circuit it. And let's try it again. Well, I hope I don't break the ROM pen for the good of science here. Uh, device read, read, and voila, that was the problem. So here we have the code, and it's uh, of course machine code. So first you have to try to see if it's, uh, if it disassembles. At this point Ken understood the chip very well, so he was able to write a disassembler in Python. And uh, you can see here, he re recognized that it was actually uh, absolutely valid code uh, for a nanoprocessor. And eventually between him and I, we, we got to understand the code fairly well. So here it is, uh, almost all commented out. Some of the most important findings were that the clock didn't use the clock chip except at startup. And uh, the other ones were the, the finer uh, details of how the interrupts are run. And then Ken was looking at the code and found something equivalent, equivalently weird is that the, at the end of the interrupts, just before the return, it was strobing one line, which is, which is counter reset comes out of here and comes back into the counter and when we both reconcile our finding it was pretty obvious that what must happen you know, it, it's nat naturally at 500 Hz but the processor as soon as he finishes the interrupt it resets it and that makes it run on the 1 kHz uh, cadence instead and sure enough that's what I see right here This pulse right there is the processor resetting the counter. And uh, you can actually tell that the code leading to it is always the same thing. It's the end of the processor of the interrupt code. It's changing over here, goes into interrupt, static interrupt code, and then, or, or it's the tail end of the interrupt. And then it goes into its regular code. So, so this is this is this is whole static. That's always the same thing. So, just looking at two lines on the scope without uh, even needing a logic analyzer, I can tell you exactly where it is in the code. It's right here, the uh, interrupt exit, and it's executing this line when my green line goes down. This is a reset reset one kilohertz counter, and then it exits exits from the interrupt and. So this whole code is completely static, and then it resumes uh, the after the interrupt the normal code which wiggles around. That tells me that the processor is working. When it's not working, 
this becomes quite repetitive and static and I don't see uh, the processor executing uh, interrupts. Huh? I'm not sure why they did that, but it's quite convenient. The next thing I want, uh, had, want to do is to see what the digits are doing on the clock chip. For that, I had to move the battery out. I didn't have the space. So this is this red connector has access to the clock chip. And I want to wire it up to my clock board. And uh, of course, I'll remove that chip. But see if it can, uh, if, if we can see the, the numbers display while it's setting it. The only possible hiccup is that it might um, change the levels uh, that the processor is sensing. So it's not 100% sure that it will work. Uh, if it doesn't, I'll have to put some amplifier stages. Okay, so I've now wired my clock chip over here to my board where I've removed the chip. So now the chip is controlling the board. And um, I have no idea if that would work, but uh, see if we can we can see the LEDs. And in order to do that, actually, I'll have to run a set command, which is the time where it should interact with the chip. Set. Here we go. Oh yeah. Yes, 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 yes. It's working. Well, it's working or it may not work. You might not be able to read it. Did you do it? Can you read the time? Read. Execute. Yeah, I did it. All right, so that works. Oh, that's nice. Great. Who needs a logic analyzer when the clock can tell you in clear what it's doing? The way it sets the watch is surprisingly complicated. It's worth noting that the module just uses the watch chip to keep time when unpowered. At startup, the processor reads the time from the watch chip once, but then it completely ignores it. Instead, it counts time on its own at a much finer grain 1 millisecond intervals using the 1 kHz interrupts we just saw on the scope. So it only interacts with the watch chip once at startup and when you set a new time. That's it. And by the way, you can see how it reads the clock and when it uh, initializes. There you go. Got the clock time from the clock chip and starts counting from there. So should be right there. Here we go. And you can see how it does it. I know that from reading the code, but what it does first is gets to the seconds. It does a long press. That gets, gets it the seconds. Once it grabs that, it has all the time in the world. So it uses the set button and gets the you no know, digits one at a time. That's 9 a.m., 9.20, and it's October 15th. And then it's done. So if we let it do it again, I'll press the reset button, I'll force it to, to read. Yep. Seconds, hours, minutes, months and day. So we are armed to the teeth with our understanding of the clock and uh, also can probe it pretty well. But it took us a whole episode, actually several days in real time, just to get there. Anyhow, the important thing is that we now know what to expect from a working set and we are positioned to try the bad ones in the next episode. And as expected, it won't quite go according to plan.